Um, we've, got, we've got another question by Tiffany, and uh, it's quite an interesting question, actually. She says, I purchased an, an, uh, I purchased an apartment from a well-known property developer. My intention was to lease the property out on Airbnb, which I have been doing for some time now. Very recently, the developer has attempted to get us, meaning the, the owners, to sign an amendment to the contract, uh, I'm assuming uh, the, the, the purchase agreement, um, which will effectively bar short-term rentals. This is extremely devastating as I rely on this income to furnish my bond repayments. What can I do to stop this? Uh, Bruno? There's case law that exists right now at this moment in time that says that body corporates are allowed to regulate uh, short-term rentals um, within the context of the actual sectional schemes and units. And th there's normally uh, a rationale behind this. So a decision is reached where the trustees decide that this is a situation um, and they will be it for security risks, noise, whatever the case is, right? So this is what the case law actually says. Then in the case law, and, and this is quite interesting because there was a misinterpretation by some people of the case. Um, there is a rationale or a reason behind it. So it's not just simply, look, a rule's a rule and that's, that's the way that it is. Do it, don't. It's there has to be a reasoning for it. And in a lot of these, they said, well, the thing is people buy into an estate because they want to have a certain lifestyle or they expect a certain level of security, et cetera, et cetera. So each case would have its own considerations. So it's not that that case creates a precedent where it's always allowed and no one can do anything about it. It's more a case of, you know, you need to look at the facts before making that call. So this didn't really take the argument any further because the body corporates are still saying they're entitled to make the decision. And the short-term Airbnb guys are saying, well, it needs to still be, a, it needs to be a good foundation for the decision that you're making. However, now the way that I look at it is it sits in favor of the body corporate 60-40 or 65-35 because it, now this case will kind of supporting that it's okay, but we'll have a look at it as opposed to the other way around where it's not okay unless you can really justify it. Now, uh, with that being said, in this particular instance, it's quite an interesting scenario because uh, my, uh, so I'm making this assumption, but the property's already been bought. So there's a sale agreement, the transfer has taken, uh, taken place, and this thing has been put, on, uh, been put on the Airbnb market. What's actually happening now is there's certain engagement agreements uh, that are provided for in the rules that say, well, certain things are allowed, but if they're allowed, there needs to be agreements between the body corporate and the specific owners on how it's going to, to take place. Uh, so it, it basically forces there, it's almost a rule that there needs to be an agreement. And this is where it starts getting a bit iffy because now new agreements were submitted. They, I'm not particularly, and I'm still checking this out. That's the problem because I'm not actually officially on the case, but a lot of people have asked me and I'm just kind of waiting where am I, like if I'm going to get the instructions and where from. But my understanding is the rules don't really provide for it. So it's an agreement, enter into this agreement. This is how things are going to take place. Now, if the rules don't provide for it, it's not a rule and you can't enforce an agreement to agree. So that's not enforceable either. So at this moment in time, I don't know if there's any foundation to cause issues or to stop these guys from doing the short-term letting until there's an AGM that's called that says, oh, we're stopping it. If there's an AGM that sets this rule, different story. Then we start arguing again, like I said, based on the case law. But at the moment as it stands where there's supposed to be some kind of engagement on how the short-term letting is going to take place, simply because the parties can't agree to it, um, it, my argument is that they shouldn't now be refused permission to, uh, to actually allow, uh, to actually rent out their place short term, because that would be very unilateral. That means that um, crazy terms could be put forward by the body corporate, and any refusal would mean that they lose their income. 
And that I feel would be like a perfect case for CSOS to have a look at. So yeah, that's kind of the, the very long winded, um, very vague without mentioning name story, but it is something that's, that's getting bigger. Like I see more and more of this, um, yeah, every day. And I must say, if I can throw in my 10 cents, I don't think it's the wisest move from a body corporate to do this. Um, from, from um, well, uh, uh, not doing heavy collections at all anymore. Um, in, in the days when, when we used to do heavy collections, I must say the, the body corporate that didn't really struggle with non-paying um, owners were the guys that allow um, Airbnb. Because uh, if, we, if we have to seriously just look at it commercially, your chances of an owner paying his levies who actually puts this, uh, the property out on Airbnb um, does generate a higher income than your normal um, renting. Well, potentially some, some uh, Airbnb investors will do about triple on rental mm. of what your normal month to month guys do. And they, the owners that will every day of the week um, pay their levies because this is an investment more than your normal rental kind of investment. This is a business. It's a day to day. You can't forget about this kind of business. And those are the, some of the best paying owners that I'm, I've seen. So at the same time, because your owners are on it and because of the way Airbnb works, I think a lot of body, body corporate are reluctant because they see an, a potential risk of increased crime or noise or whatever. But I would really like to, to invite most of those uh, body corporate members to just do one Airbnb stay yourself. Go on Airbnb, look at the property, see the way it works. If you're a bad host or a bad guest, you have such a bad rating, um, it's not going to happen again. This is why Airbnb, Airbnb is so popular. So, you know, don't knock it till you try it. And it could be the thing um, that makes your body corporate thrive and actually brings in levies um, so you can have that new paint of coat that the uh, coat of paint that you actually desperately need on those buildings. Yeah. Um, so uh, that's just my 10 cents on still nice daily pro Airbnb. <laughs> so what's, what's interesting. Uh, so what's interesting here is so allegedly, I, I, I don't know, but allegedly this is because, and it's happened before in a couple of, of schemes if you have a majority of guys that already have control over the scheme and they're leasing out their places at certain rates, they want to control the rate at which uh, yes. the leasing is done. So this is where the prohibitions come in, where they don't outright prohibit, but they control to such a degree where they fix prices so that there's no undercutting on pricing. And in this particular instance, I suspect it's the same one. Over here, they're actually talking about, a, a, you know, there being a hospitality vibe within this con uh, a complex, which, me, which they wouldn't want to compete. They wouldn't want a short-term um, or Airbnb host to compete with them, right? And this is where the issue comes in. And um, I do see this a lot with developers, because sometimes what happens is there's a development and the developer hangs on to 60%. Um, so sometimes when we say, oh, the developer is giving us trouble, it's the, you know, it, it's, uh, you know, don't misunderstand. It's the developer through the body corporate, but, you know, it's pretty much one and the same because of voting rights. So when, uh, you know, th th that's just context. And then the other thing is, so the, on the flip side, when I've consulted with the developers, the flip side of it is not everyone uses Airbnb. Um, and this is where I told people, you know, maybe we actually need to get together and figure out what the best practice is, because I get it. Some of them gave me examples where people do short term letting. But OK, so like, for instance, like some of the CBDs, short term letting is by the hour. Right. Exactly. Uh, and it's a brothel. I, uh, and yeah. we've, we've all evicted brothels. So yeah. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I, I hear you and I agree. Yeah. I, we've seen that. <laughs> yeah. So, so that's the flip side. That's the flip side yes. is if it was Airbnb, totally, totally agree. But some of the guys have shown me and like, no, it's really bad. We need to stop this. But like Solna said, like I said, that's reasoning. If you go, but they're running a brothel, we need to stop it. Great. 
there's a good reason for it. Or we live in a, it's a retirement village. We don't want anyone here. We want to control uh, people coming in. Mm. Cool, makes sense. Yes. But there's a reason for that. Uh, you can't just do it because you want to do it. Exactly. And if you had a brothel in your property, unfortunately, you're not going to have a ceiling lift. I do not know why, but Bruno, same, same story. Tell me if you've seen this every single time I've done an eviction and it turns out it was a brothel. The sheriff calls me surprised and says, the ceiling's gone. And I say, <laughs> I do not know. I will leave it at that. That was my little joyful nice. eviction <laughs> comment and stuff we know as eviction lawyers that we would have preferred not to. <laughs> Chris, that was too entertaining. You enjoyed that one too much. <laughs> Because you said you said uh, re rental by the hour, and I was thinking, well, what if somebody just wanted to sleep for an hour? You know, like guy was really tired. He just needed a nap for an hour. It may not yeah. be a problem. You know night. they have that. You know they have that in Japan at the airports. They've got those little cubes, and you can rent it out by the hour. It's got a little desk and a bed, um, and it's like coin operated. You go in, you sleep, you get onto your flight. So that could work in Japan. Um, in some other CBD. countries. Yeah, <laughs> it's not a workstation. <laughs> <laughs> oh, guys, uh, thank you so much, though. Uh, it was very, very entertaining. Jonty says, We rent a property in Centurion. There are three houses on the property. The owner gets an ESCOM bill each month. The three houses on the small holding have meters from a prepaid services provider. Um, Jonty wants to know Is the landlord allowed to set the tariff and make money? He says he received an email from the prepaid service provider that indicates that the tariff set was in accordance with what was provided for by the landlord. Uh, he says, according to his calculations between the ESCOM bill and the funds paid to the service provider, it does indicate that uh, the landlord is making money from him and the other uh, occupants uh, or, or other lessees on the property. Uh, he wants to know, I mean, is this legal? What can be done in this particular instance? It depends on, on, the, on the facts. So in this case, if the meter company, if the service provider says, we are charging you, we are charging the landlord this amount, and it's exactly the same amount that the landlord is charging you, but it's more than what ESCOM is charging. That makes 100% sense because the party profiting from that is then the meter reading company and they are entitled within their service level agreements with the, uh, uh, the electricity providers, be it ESCOM or the municipality, whatever the case might be, um, they are allowed to resell electricity and based on their service level agreement, they are allowed to make a profit on that. However, in this case, if, if, what the landlord is charging the tenant is also what the service provider is charging them, then it's fine even if that's a little more than what ESCOM would be charging. However, if the meter reading company says, no, 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 we charged one rand, but the landlord is charging one rand 50, that is not allowed. So the landlord, the owner of the property is never entitled to resell electricity because remember, we have very strict legislation in the country with regards to um, the sale and resale of electricity. So all of those things are super, almost overly regulated to the point where when we don't have electricity, we're still stuck on only one service provider, but be that as it may. Um, uh, unfortunately, um, in this case, it, it does sound like um, it's the landlord is charging the same as the meter reading company. So then he's not making money that is allowed. But if it's more, definitely not landlords not entitled to, to make a profit on the resale of electricity. Thanks, Alna. Um, we're going to move on to the next question, which was asked by Simone. Simone says, is it legal for your landlord to have a spare key to your apartment and to enter your apartment without your permission? So, uh, Sola, I think maybe you want to take this one. Well, I think I think my expression on that question sort of answered him already. <laughs> definitely legal, definitely legal for an uh, for the owner to have his uh, spare set of keys uh, to the property, hundred percent, because 
If anything weird happens, most lease agreements ideally have a clause that says, um, should there be emergencies, emergency repairs, the geezer burst, the neighbor's call and say, my goodness, there's like a river running out of the house or it, it caught fire and there's flames everywhere. You need to be able to access that property. 100% okay with that. Even in a situation like, like I've just described, emergency access to the premises, you would even as a landlord be allowed to gain emergency access by using a locksmith. So, but this is, I mean, serious emergencies, not my tenant has pay, hasn't paid his rent for three months and suddenly I feel like I smell the, something burning from the property. I had to go and check. That's not that's not an emergency, guys. Clever, but <laughs> that's not an emergency. I've seen that. In a case where, where you do need to gain emergency access, you are allowed to, but you are never, ever, ever, as a landlord, allowed to, to enter the premises without prior arrangement and consent from the tenant. Even in a case where the tenant said, brilliant, you can come by for an inspection tomorrow afternoon at five, the tenant forgets and he's not there. As the landlord, you are not allowed to enter the premises unless the tenant grants you access. I know it's your property. I know you're the owner of the property, but as the landlord, you gave away your right of occupation. And one of the essentialia in, the, in a lease agreement is that the tenant enjoys undisturbed use and enjoyment of the premises. You're not allowed as the landlord to feel that the tenant doesn't maintain the garden properly. So now every Saturday morning you rock up there with your piti bruki and your takis and you mow the lawn. You're not entitled to do that. You're the owner of the property, but you're not entitled to enter the premises without the tenant's um, agreement. Now, usually what I see is uh, if a tenant doesn't pay rent or the lease agreement's been cancelled, Many owners then believe, but now all their rights and obligations fell away. So my obligation to provide undisturbed use and enjoyment is gone. Unfortunately, if the right of occupation isn't um, returned to the landlord voluntarily by the tenant at the end of the lease agreement or whatever the, the case might be, you can't get it back unless you obtain an eviction order. And this is in terms of Section 26 of the Constitution. It's not in terms of the Rental Housing Act or anything else. This is in terms of the highest law in our country. So um, it's really not one of those that you can, um, you know, sort of just work around. So definitely entitled to the keys, but not entitled to use those keys unless um, the tenant gives you back the right of occupation by um, moving out at the end of the lease term or on prior arrangement on inspection. And unfortunately, um, you can be a trespasser on your own property. So you can go to quickly jail for this. So you won't be in jail for long, don't stress. It's not going to be like two year jail time, but you can spend like a few months in jail and that's more than enough to, you know, not make you use that set of keys again. <laughs> Jail is jail. Uh, <laughs> even if it's for one day, so I'm not going to jail. I've never uh, been so. in jail, so I don't know. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I'm <yeah>. bragging. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 